Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. We just did two videos on Undead, so let's use Undead as our running example. In this video, let's imagine I had a group of first level player characters and I wanted to throw some Undead at them. I choose Ghouls, because I think Ghouls are an interesting low level bad guy and I can throw a few of them at the players. Ghouls have an armor class of 12. How likely are my players to hit these Ghouls? That's what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to talk about the math of Dungeons and Dragons, and we're only going to talk, it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be a short video, because I only want to give you enough information. I don't want to overwhelm a brand new player. This is going to be super obvious stuff for most of you, but if you are a brand new player, if you're a new Dungeon Master, and you're looking at this, and you feel overwhelmed by the math, I, I can't completely solve that problem. I mean, if you have math phobia, there's only so much I can do about that. My powers are limited, but I can at least demystify the math a little bit and give you a little bit more confidence so that you feel comfortable making changes on the fly. So how likely are my players to hit these ghouls? Well, there's two ways to go about figuring this out. One is to just ask my players what their bonuses to hit is and then do the math manually, but that's a pain in the butt and would take a long time. So instead, I'm just going to do it in my head. And I know I can tell in my head without having to write anything down that my players have about a 70% chance to hit one of these ghouls. How do I know that? I know they have a 70% chance to hit one of these ghouls because I know how they generated their stats. They either used the 4d6 take the highest three method and then they placed them in the order they want, or they took the list of numbers from the player's handbook and put them in the order they want. But in either instance, I can count on them having a 15, let's say a 15 in their highest stat. In other words, we can assume the fighter is attacking with their strength, the rogue is attacking with their dexterity, the wizard, if they are going to make an attack roll for some reason, is going to be attacking with their intelligence. And if we assume that they picked a mathematically advantageous species, that means they're going to put a plus two in that stat, which means they're going to go from a 15. Let's use the fighter as an example. The fighter is going to put their 15, their high stat, in their strength. They're going to pick a species that gives them plus two to their strength. That's going to get them to 17. A 17 is a plus three. They are also proficient in whatever it is they're trying to do that's another plus two that's the mysterious plus two where does it come from and all this math equations it comes when you are doing something you know how to do you get your proficiency bonus which starts off at plus two it does go up over time but we are assuming this is a first level party three plus two is five which means when the players are rolling to hit they're going to roll a 20 sided die and they're this is this is important this is the engine that drives all the math in this game they're going to roll a 20 sided die and they're going to add five to it and they have to beat a 12 because that's the armor class of a ghoul which means they have to roll a seven. They have to roll a seven to hit a ghoul. Seven or higher on a 20-sided die is a 70% chance to hit, which is quite high, by the way. So you can see out of the gate, I did a little bit of math in my head and came up with an accurate result. How likely are the players to hit these ghouls? Actually, they are very likely to hit them. Already, I have used a lot of terminology and a lot of math that I don't want to assume you know. So for a lot of people, this is going to be super obvious and they're going to they're going to check out of this video already because they're going to feel like, well, I know all this stuff. That's fantastic. This video is not for you. It's for new dungeon masters who really know nothing about math. So when I say my players have about a 70% chance to hit this ghoul, where am I getting that number from? Well, it starts with the D20. The D20 has 20 sides on it, which means any given side, let's imagine you picked a specific number, seven. What are the odds of rolling exactly seven on a 20-sided die? 5%. How did I arrive at that number? Let's figure out. Well, because percent means per hundred. If I rolled this die a hundred times, I can, I would be, it would be reasonable to bet that the die would come up exactly seven about five times. Everybody likes rolling a crit, a natural 20, we call it. We mean natural as opposed to unmodified, right? And that's something that happens all the time when we play. Someone will say the number they rolled when you need to know their, their result. And sometimes someone will say the result and you think they just told you the number they rolled. That's why we use the term natural. This is a natural 20. What are the odds of rolling a natural 20? 5%, 1 in 20. That means if I roll the die 100 times, about 5 times I will roll exactly 20. We, players, ascribe a lot of meaning to this number and this number, but the die doesn't know the difference between them. Technically, there is no difference between, as far as the die is concerned, there's no difference between rolling this as opposed to rolling this or rolling this. As far as the die is concerned, they're all the same. They each are equally likely to come up. They each have a 5% chance of coming up. But the math in D&D is based on target numbers. If I tell you that this ghoul uh, has a 12 armor class and you have, you know, plus five to hit, for instance, and you figure out and you do the math in your head and you're like, I need to roll a seven to beat it. It's technically seven or higher. 
That means you have this whole spread of numbers from 7 all the way over to 20 that will result in you hitting. So we're counting all of these. Each of those is 5%. So if you did the math in your head, you'd go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and you'd get to 70%. That's how I know my players have about a 70% chance to hit this ghoul. Let's imagine I want to make this ghoul harder to hit. I could give it armor, for instance. I could raise its dexterity, or I could just say it has thicker than normal natural hide. And I could, using those methods, I could get its armor from 12 to whatever number I wanted. Well, what number do I want to get it to? That is, this is how I think as a dungeon master. I don't just think, well, I'm going to, I want this ghoul to be harder to hit. I will give it plus one to its armor class. That would make it harder to hit. That is technically true. But how, how big an impact is that one difference going to make? Let's talk about that. If you've been paying attention, you know that if I increase the ghoul's armor class from 12 to 13, I have made it 5% less likely that my players will hit it. How much of a difference is that 5%? It's not a lot, but I think you can count on a first level party in one battle against your AC 13 super ghoul. It will come up maybe once, one die roll, one attack in the entire battle. How did I arrive at that conclusion? Well, it, a given battle lasts between five and six rounds. And if you have about four or five players, that means you're looking at about roughly 20 attack rolls per battle. Obviously, that number is going to vary wildly between one battle and another, one group and another. It makes a lot of assumptions. But if we have adjusted the armor class by one, if we've made it 5% harder to hit, and there's 25% on this die, that means you would have to roll this die 20 times in order for there to be one instance where I would have hit the AC uh, 12 ghoul, but I missed the AC 13 ghoul. Because we're dealing with a 20 side die, we are constantly dealing in 5%. And that's, I think, useful for us because dealing in fives, multiplying by fives is relatively easy. If your players are only fighting one ghoul, then they're not going to get 20 opportunities to attack that thing. And so you won't see that, you, you shouldn't expect to see, I will say, you shouldn't expect to see that one, that one point difference in armor class really come up. But once you've got four or five ghouls in the battle, now you've made it so that your players are probably going to attack about 20 times over the course of this encounter. And in that process, there will be on average one die roll that would have hit your AC 12 ghoul, but misses your AC 13 ghoul. So me as a dungeon master, if I want my ghouls to be tougher, I'm not going to give them just plus one AC because I don't think it's going to come up that often. Giving them plus two to their armor class, taking it from a 12 to a 14. And now instead of it being 70% likely that the players are going to hit, now it is 60% likely that they're going to hit. And now we're getting close to 50%. 50% is hitting half the time. One out of every 10 attacks that would have hit my AC 12 ghoul are going to miss my AC 14 ghoul. And now at that point, I think we're definitely going to see that come up in the course of one given battle. So as far as ghouls are concerned, increasing uh, their armor class from 12 to 13, not really going to make a difference. 12 to 14, now we're going to start to see a difference, but that's all predicated on a ghoul's armor class. A ghoul normally has armor class of 12. What about something else? What about something like a bugbear chieftain? A bugbear chieftain has an armor class of 17. What are the odds of you hitting this AC 17 bugbear? Well, let's imagine you had no bonus to hit. Let's imagine you had a 10 uh, strength and you were using a weapon that you were not proficient with. You have to roll a 20-sided die and you have to hit an AC 17. There's a little bit of a misleading. I think there's a tendency when we first start playing to do the math wrong in our heads because we naturally want to subtract 17 from 20 and that leaves us with 3. 3 times 5, 5% chance for each number, uh, is 15. That would mean a 15% chance to hit our bugbear. No, because we win if we equal 17. So we have to count the 17 when we're doing the math. So we don't subtract 17 from 20. We start at 17 and count up 17, 18, 19, 20. There's actually a 5, 10, 15, 20, a 20% chance to hit our bugbear with an unmodified roll. Your players probably aren't going to be using unmodified rolls. They're probably going to be plus five to hit. Plus five to hit is a plus 25% chance, which means now they've got a 45% chance to hit, right? I haven't even really figured out what the target number is in my head. I've just taken the 20% that they need from an unmodified roll, 17, 18, 19, 25, 10, 15, 20%, and I've added their plus five to hit on their die roll, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 
25 and 20 is 45%. They have a 45% chance to hit. 45% chance to hit is less than 50%, which means they're going to be... Mi Here's what that means. I just want to help you internalize this. Even though it may seem like a 45% chance to hit is still pretty beefy, still pretty meaty, and not that far away from a 60% chance to hit, 45% chance to hit does mean your players are going to be missing most of the time. A 45% chance of hitting means a 55% chance of missing, and 55% is more than half. So that is something to keep in mind when you're dealing with a, translating the math of D&D into player psychology. Players don't like to miss. It would be better to have many easy-to-hit monsters than few hard-to-hit monsters, because even though the math might work out the same, your player's experience is going to be very different. In one scenario, many easy-to-hit monsters, the players are going to be hitting all the time, and they're going to feel heroic. The other scenario, a few hard-to-hit monsters, the players are going to be missing all the time, and it's going to be really frustrating, especially if you've got five or six or seven players sitting around the table, and the players have to wait maybe as much as 20 minutes between taking turns, and they roll one 20-sided die, and they miss, and then they're done, and their entire turn took 30 seconds, and now they're really frustrated. So that's the danger zone. That's the uh, <laughs> that's the danger zone is is between I would say a fifty five percent chance to hit and a forty five percent chance to hit. You're in that threshold of I'm now going to be missing half or more of the time. And there is a psychology here. Taking your AC seventeen bugbear and saying, "Gosh, forty five percent chance of hitting to me still sounds like a lot. Let's beef him up to eighteen armor class." Now I only have a 40% chance of hitting, and that 5% difference happening between 45 and 40 is going to make the players feel even more frustrated. Mathematically, it is linear, but psychologically, it is not. This is something you learn as a game designer, especially in video games, where your game is live and people can complain about it, you better, you better patch it quick, is that even if your telemetry is telling you these, these characters are all equally useful. If the players conclude that that is not the case, you, you don't get to ship a copy of Matt Colville with every game to sit there on the couch next to the player and explain how clever you are and how dumb they are, and that actually they're all equally likely. You have to deal with the player's psychology, not your math. That's why I am far less likely to give, for instance, our bugbear chieftain an 18 armor class as opposed to his normal 17 than I am a ghoul. A ghoul, because he's got a 12 armor class, because the players are 70% likely to hit him, going from 70% to 65% to 60%, 60% is still most of the time, but 55%, 50%, now we're getting into player getting frustrated territory. Hopefully this is useful to new players just starting out when you're trying to figure out how likely are my players to hit and what kind of difference will it make if I change this monster's armor class. You can rely on your players having a plus five to hit. They may have more and they will eventually get more as their stats go up, as their proficiency bonus goes up, as you give, as you award magic items. But plus five to hit against any given armor class is the distance from that armor class to 20, including that armor class. So for a ghoul, right, with an armor class of 12, you're 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's nine, the range of nine. Nine times five is 45, plus the plus five the players get to their die roll, which is 25, 25, and 45 is how you get to a 70% chance to hit. And I guarantee you there are people watching this right now. First of all, there are people watching this right now that are like, duh. But I guarantee you there are people watching this right now who are like, okay, you lost me. And this is the kind of thing where doing it over and over again actually will result in understanding. And you'll start to live your life behind the screen in 5% increments. Like anything else in life, when we sit down and start to do it, it will be tricky and it'll take a little bit of work and thought, but once you start thinking in terms of the distance on the number line, which is how we should be living our lives, the distance between the armor class and 20, including the armor class, that's one percentage, and then we add it to our players to hit bonus, and that's how we know what are the odds of them actually hitting. Obviously, another way of doing it is starting with the armor class, armor class of 12, they're plus five to hit, so subtract uh, five from that, you get to seven. Seven to 20 is a 70% chance of hitting. So there's a couple of different ways to skin this cat. I don't know, Floofy Cat. Why does everybody want to skin you? Why would anyone want to skin my tiny cat? Mwah. I love tiny Floofy Kitty. Those are the two ways to calculate how likely your players are to hit. You start with their attack bonus, which you can assume is going to be plus five at first level, and you can either subtract that from the monster's armor class, and then measure the difference between the result and 20, multiply that by five, that's your percentage to hit, 
or you can just add up percentages. And these are things I do, I can do on the fly because I've done this a million times. So there's a, the beginning of this process is some understanding and then a lot of practice. So what does it mean to give your players a plus one magic item? Well, it means they're 5% more likely to hit. It really doesn't matter what the target number is. Your bugbear with a 17 armor class or your ghoul with a 12 armor class in both instances. And it also, it doesn't matter what the uh, what level your players are or what their attack bonus is. Maybe some of them are plus five to hit. Maybe some of them are plus seven. In both instances, giving your players a plus one longsword means they're all, anyone who's using it, is plus 5% more likely to hit. Which again, is not going to come up that often. It maybe will come up at 5% plus one will maybe come up uh, once per night. The problem is that your players have lots of ways to get bonuses and they all add up. And so that's one of the reasons the game does not recommend you give your players a plus one weapon until they're about fifth level. For instance, one of the easiest ways for my players to get a bonus to hit, and in fact, this is something I'm probably going to change, is I play with the optional rule in Dungeon Master's Guide that flanking awards advantage. I play with a highly tactical game. But I think uh, flanking granting advantage is too too much of a bonus. And so I'm going to switch it from uh, advantage to a plus two to hit. And let's talk about why. Advantage, as you probably know, means uh, you're going to roll two 20-sided dice and you're going to take the highest one and use that as your attack roll. But what does that mean mathematically? Well, you may be surprised to learn that mathematically, rolling two 20-sided dice and taking the highest instead of one means, on average, you're plus five more to hit. If we assume that your players are attacking with the stat that this is their highest stat and that they're proficient with the weapon and they've got plus five coming out of the gate and then you give them advantage, that's another plus five. They're now plus 10 to hit, basically, which means they would be hitting an armor class of 20 50 percent of the time. That's that's crazy. Right? It's essentially I look at it this way. Giving your players advantage on the attack roll guarantees they're going to hit. And, and I say that even though there'll be people in the doobly-doo who'll be like, oh, it's not a guarantee. And they're, 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 they're correct. It's not. But I think of it as being a guarantee because armor class does not come in every flavor. Your players are not going to be fighting creatures with armor class of three or armor class of six. They're going to be fighting characters that bad guys that have mostly armor classes between 13 and 17. And at that point, 13 to 17, starting off with plus five to hit, giving them advantage, which is another plus five. That's like plus 10 to hit. If the armor class is 15, they only need to roll five. They're going to be hitting 75% of the time, 80. Now, an 80% chance to hit is not the same as 100% chance to hit. This is the lesson, everyone paying attention to 538, Nate Silver's uh, forecast of the last election learned is that saying that this candidate has an 80% chance of winning, or in fact, a 70% chance of winning means they still have a 30% chance of losing, but that's not how we think. We don't think that way. When we hear that this candidate has a 70% chance of winning, we think, oh, it's in the bag. For our purposes, though, as Dungeon Masters, granting your players advantage is guaranteeing, asterisk, not a guarantee, that they're going to hit. And there's something else with advantage that I discovered kind of bugs me a little bit, is that because you get to do, uh, you know, in dungeon, in, on the die, this number is no different than this number or this number. But in D&D, this number is totally different than the others, because if I if this 5% chance, again, which is the same 5% chance as this or this, if this 5% chance comes up, your players get to roll their damage twice. And if they have advantage, there's double the odds that they're going to get a 20 instead of it being 5%, it's 10% chance. Now, if you consider the fact that they're getting advantage from flanking, which means there's two characters who are on opposite sides of the bad guy, which prevents the bad guy from being able to be in two places at once and defend against both of them. Now you've got, instead of two dice, each trying to get a 5% chance, you've got four dice each trying to get a 5% chance. It is now, you've doubled, it is now much more likely that your players are going to start getting critical hits once they start flanking if you grant them advantage for flanking, which is why I think in my next game, at least when we start, we're going to begin with flanking just giving you plus two, which is how it used to work in, I think, third and fourth edition D&D. Plus two is just plus 10%, and that is a meaningful difference, enough for the players to seek it out and want to get into dangerous situations just so they can flank, and that makes me happy. That makes the game more tactical, it makes strategy more important, but it's not such an overwhelming bonus like plus five from advantage. Alternatively, another thing you could do, and I may try this, is say advantage gives you an extra d4 on top of your d20, because mathematically that's going to come out at about 10% on average. So thinking, sitting here thinking about the idea of allowing my players, if they have advantage, to uh, instead of rolling 2d20, just add a d4 to their die, I want to know how is that going to change the math? 
well, I can figure that out, and this happens a lot in D&D, by figuring out what is the average result on any given die. What is the average result on a D4? It's two and a half. Which, again, if you are not a math person, it may not be obvious why that should be, but let's figure it out. Using a D4 in our example is useful to us because we can easily plot it here in this video. We can put a 1 over here, we can put a 4 over here, and we can put the other numbers in between. And we want to know what is the average result on a D4. Well, what is the number in the middle? And again, there will be people in the doobly-doo talk about mean and median and mode, and that's fine. If you want to go read that stuff and look into it more, I encourage you to do so. But for the just for the purposes of the new player that knows nothing about math, who just wants to know what is the average result on a D10, you're looking for the number in the middle, and all the dice all have an even number of facings, which means there is no number in the middle. If instead of a D4, we had a D5, which some people make for games that I don't play, suddenly now we do have a number in the middle. The three is in the middle. We have two numbers to the left of the three and two numbers to the right of the three, so we can confidently say that the average result on a five-sided die is three. But we don't have a five-sided die, we have a four-sided die, and there is no number in the middle, so we're just going to split the number line in half and put a number here. That number would be two and a half, obviously. I think using the number line to understand this is more intuitive, uh, but also you could just add up the facings and divide by the number of facings, which is how they teach you how to do it in school. Four plus three plus two plus one, adding up all the facings gets us ten, divided by the number of facings, which is four. Ten divided by four is two and a half, so the average result on a D4 is two and a half which translates to 12.5% on average if we're giving our players an extra d4 on top of their d20 to hit because of uh, advantage or flanking. Which is really just, it's an example I used in order to talk about how to figure out averages on dice. But the same thing, the same process works for a d10. What's the average result on a d10? It's five and a half. What's the average result? This is important. On a d20, it's 10 and a half. It's always half the value, so 20 divided by 2 is 10, plus a half a percent, 10 and a half. This is important to us because, for instance, in D&D, we have to make death saving throws, and the target number for a death saving throw is 10. What are the odds of us being a 10? Without even calculating percentages, you know that you are likely to make it because the average result on a 20-sided die is 10 and a half, and the number you're trying to beat is a 10. So without even adding up all the five percentses, you know that you are likely to make, not by much, but you are likely to make your death saving throw in any given round. It's a little better than 50%. If you do the math, it turns out to be 55% because you're counting all the numbers from 10 to 20, including the 10. Intuitively, if you're doing the math and you're counting 5%, you're always going to be, well, I've got a 50% chance to hit because 10, 20 from 10 is 10 times 5 is 50. But then you'll go back and go, oh, wait, I am including the number 10 because I, I still win if I hit a 10. So technically, there's 11 numbers and 11 times 5 is 55%. Again, I guarantee you I have already, it may be very, this may be very obvious to many of you, but there was a time when it was not obvious to me and playing D&D helped make it obvious. So I guarantee you there are some people watching this that I have already lost. I lost them a long time ago. But maybe you watch the video more than once. I'm sure there are other videos out there on this subject. But let's talk about what we learned, because I actually think we covered quite a lot in this video. We now know how to figure out what, what is the average result on any given die. We talked about what does granting advantage do mathematically. We talked about what does giving a player a plus one weapon do mathematically. We talked about how to figure out how likely you are to hit without actually going and figuring out what your player's stats are, and how much does changing a monster's armor class change the likelihood to hit. What is the difference in a plus one? What's the difference between being, uh, you know, 55% likely to hit and 45% likely to hit? So to my way of thinking, we've covered a lot of ground. I'm not a math teacher. I have no idea whether or not this lesson was useful. And it is my hope that if you got lost along the way, I encourage you to comment in the doobly-doo and we will all do our best to shepherd you along. Because playing D&D is one of the things that makes you better at math. You start learning what is, what does it really mean to only have a 15% chance of hitting. It, some, it feels very unlikely sometimes, but then you will discover it does come up. Let's all start rolling. And there are real world applications here. You will discover when everyone else is acting like something that has a 70% likelihood of succeeding is a sure thing, you will be focused on that 30% and you'll have a very real understanding. Humans do not come built in with an, uh, an understanding of odds. We are incredibly poor when it comes to judging odds and risk. That is not something that our evolutionary heritage has gifted us with, but if you play a lot of D&D, you will develop a sense for that stuff, and it will stand you in good stead throughout your entire life. 
So get started, get started doing the math in your head, get started figuring these things out, and get started working out for yourself what does it mean to give your ghoul uh, a bonus to their dexterity so that now instead of needing a, a, an armor class, beating an armor class of 12, they have to be in an armor class of uh, 14 or maybe even 15, you will start noticing significant differences there, as opposed to going from 12 to 13, which you probably won't notice. That's the video on dice math, folks. Uh, I hope you liked it. I hope it was useful for some of you. Please comment in the doobly-doo below. Let me know what you think. Next video, we're going to talk about comics in general, and specifically a comic that I, I wrote. And because that is not a D&D related subject, I'm going to make sure that when I upload this video, I'm going to immediately at the same time upload another video that is D&D related and also sort of related tangentially to the subject of this comic. No spoilers. I want to encourage all new Dungeon Masters to come by AdventureLookup.com. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo. And also, I am still working on the Stronghold Rules Kickstarter, uh, a lot, doing a lot of research, uh, working on getting an LLC and tax ID and stuff like that. And that stuff all takes time. But if you want to be alerted when the Stronghold Kickstarter goes live, there is a link in the doobly-doo. You follow it. You give us your email. And we promise we will only email you once. And it's to let you know when the Stronghold Kickstarter goes live. Finally, as you know, I uh, I do not run ads in front of my videos. I'm an independent fantasy author. If you want to help support the channel, come by my Amazon page. There's a link to that in the doobly-doo. And there are lots of links to the doobly-doo. It seems like it grows all the time. Like me. Wait, what? Thanks for sticking around through the Dice Math video, folks. Until next time, peace out.